There Will Be Wolves by Carlene Bradford, Chapter 14 They were wed on one of the first soft days of summer. It was a simple marriage. They walked together to Great St. Martin's, Bruno carrying Verity. The priest heard their vows, and they walked back home again. For a wedding feast, they dipped into their small supply of coins and added meat to the nightly stew. The garden throve, and soon Ursula was harvesting her herbs. Bruno rebuilt the shelves alongside the hearth, and she drew greater and greater satisfaction from watching them fill up with bags and sacks and hanging swatches of drying leaves and flowers. Finally, one day, Bruno lowered the front shutters before he left for his work, and Ursula set out her wares. The apothecary was open again. That night, they sat by the fire. Samson suddenly sprang up with a bark. Horses' hooves clamored on the cobblestones outside. Ursula called sharply to stay him. He still hadn't learned any sense about horses, but he ran to the door in a paroxysm of whining and tail-wagging. A knock rang out, the door opened, and a figure walked in. Samson went mad. Ursula, Master William, are you here? The voice was deeper than Ursula remembered, but there was no mistaking it. David! Ursula sprang up. David was a hand taller than when she had last seen him. He was dressed sumptuously, and a cloak of heavy scarlet wool hung from his shoulders. He looked so much more like a young man now, and so much less like the small boy she had known, that she stopped, suddenly shy. Samson, however, threw himself upon his master. David knelt to tossle the dog's head. Samson, I hardly dared hope he would still be here. He looked up at Ursula and Bruno with a happy smile. I'm here with my father, he said, to reclaim my uncle's house from the archbishop. My father has already gone to see him, but I couldn't wait to come here. Where is Master William, and what has happened to the house? David, I can hardly believe it is you. But here, sit, Ursula cried, pulling a small coffer forward. I have so much to tell you, and I want to hear so much from you. But first, she sobered, I must tell you, my father is dead. He died last summer on the crusade. David's eyes clouded. I wanted to see him again, he said, to have him meet my father, to thank him for what he did for me. I'm so sorry, Ursula. Then he seemed to hear what else Ursula had said. On the crusade, he asked. Went you on the crusade? With those to him? To him, aimless wanderers. In such a way did the Jews speak of those who had persecuted them so heartlessly. Ursula met Bruno's eyes. We will tell you of that later, she answered. It was a thing of necessity, not of choice. But I want to hear of you. How did you get back to Mainz? What happened to your family there? We heard that only a handful escaped. We were among that handful, David replied. His face darkened, and Ursula guessed that his memories were no less painful than her own. She reached out a hand to him. I feared for you. I'm so thankful you were spared. They talked long into the night. Samson remained glued to David's feet the whole time. For a moment, Ursula had forgotten about Verity. The child had crept into a corner near the open trap door to the cellar. Suddenly a piercing scream brought them all to their feet. Verity, Ursula cried, but she was nowhere in sight. In the cellar, Bruno said. The cry came from the cellar. They rushed down and found her, unhurt, but cowering in terror, standing at the wall above her. A grotesque animal's head, carved into the wall there, hung out over her. The light from the fire coming in through the trap door caused its shadow to flicker and move on the wall behind it. Wolf, Verity screamed. Wolf. Ursula ran to her and gathered her into her arms. It's just a stone wolf, she soothed. Just a carved wolf. Then two realizations struck her at the same time. The child had finally spoken, and she had shrieked out wolf. Her father's last words came back to her. Unconsciously, she repeated them out loud. Look to the wolf, she stared at the carving. Look to the wolf. What are you saying, David broke in. My father, she said slowly. As he lay dying, he said that. Look to the wolf. I knew not what he meant. But it is a wolf, this wolf, that guards the door. David went over to the wall and reached up his hand to place it on the beast's muzzle. Ursula was confused. What door? What do you mean? Did he never tell you then? David asked. At Ursula's shake of the head, he went on. Do you remember when your father hid me? You couldn't imagine how we managed to conceal ourselves here in the cellar. Yes, I remember, Ursula answered, still bewildered. There is a door here, David went on, a hidden door. And underneath this cellar, there's another secret cellar. He never told you that? No, Ursula answered. Her voice trembled. Unless, unless that is what he was trying to tell me at the end. But how do you open it? The wolf, David answered. 
The wolf holds the key. Bruno, fetch a light for us and I'll show you. Bruno was back in an instant with a lightened wick floating in a dish of tallow. Come here, David said. Bruno brought the light to the wall, and they clustered around him, Verity clinging tightly to Ursula. The flame cast even more fantastic shadows. The other carved heads danced on the walls around them. Something or someone of great value must have been hidden here once, David said. The opening of the door is marvelously contrived. Watch. He pressed his hands against the neck of the wolf. Ursula gasped as the head and the stone upon it, which it was carved, suddenly began to spring outward. Inside the dark opening, they could just make out a ladder leading down into what seemed to be a black hole. David took the light from Bruno and started down. Come, follow me, he called back. Ursula passed Verity over to Bruno and then clambered after David into the musty dankness of the secret cellar. The walls here were rougher than those of the cellar above, rubble pressed together rather than cut stones. Ursula recognized the building method from the stone walls surrounding Cologne itself. Roman, she murmured. The cellar must have been dug in Roman times, and then the foundation of their own houses laid on top. Her eyes were drawn away from the walls, however, when the light revealed what was in the cramped room. A straw pallet lay in one corner, and a table and a chair sat in the middle. My father always said this was the house where Emperor Henry was hidden when he was a boy, she whispered. I thought he imagined things, but maybe he was right. Then she caught her breath as she saw something else. On the table lay a deep green velvet pouch. She moved swiftly over to it. Her hand reached out, hovering. Hardly breathing at all now, she forced herself to pick it up, forced her mind to stop the wild imaginings that had suddenly taken hold of her. The pouch jingled and sagged in her hand, as if as if it was filled with... Bruno anxiously called down to them. Ursula's head burst up through the opening. He did pay my father. He was telling the truth. God forgive me for disbelieving him. Count Emil was telling the truth. She reached up her hand, and a cascade of silver coins, gleaming in the wavering light, poured out onto the floor at Bruno's feet. Why did your father not tell you sooner? They were back upstairs, Ursula still holding the pouch unbelievingly. David stared at it. Why would he have left it there in the first place, he asked. He must have felt there was too much danger of losing it if we took it with us, Ursula answered. And he was right. We would have lost it. She paused and then went on. He must have meant it to be here for us to start with anew when we returned. He wasn't himself those last few days before we left. So much had happened. I imagine this was all he could think of to do. But then he became so ill. He grew so confused. When he finally tried to tell me, he couldn't. Verity snuggled up to her and raised her face questioningly. Not a real wolf? she asked timidly. Down there. Not real? She stumbled over the German words. Ursula hugged her tightly. No, my pet. It's not real. It's a carving, like what Bruno does, only not so pretty, she added, laughing. Then her face became serious, and she stared down at the pouch in her hand. I sought this for so long, she said, so desperately, and now that I finally have it? With a sudden gesture, she held the pouch out to Bruno. Here, take it. Tomorrow carry it with you and give it to the priest. Let it be given to God. Bruno reached out to accept it, his eyes questioning. Ursula looked around at the warm, firelit room, heavy with the scent of her herbs. She looked at David with Samson laying at his feet. She felt Verity's soft cheek nuzzling into her neck. Then she looked back at Bruno. I already have everything I need, she said.